guys, so um, when you deal with frame transformations and vectors, keeping track of stuff can be a little bit tricky. And so I'm going to tell you about things, but here's what I want you to, this is important. Here's what I want you to take away from this is not remember a bunch of rules for, okay, in this frame you do this, and this means that, and that means that. I don't want you to take that away. I don't want you to sort of memorize a bunch of stuff and think, okay, now that I've memorized a bunch of stuff, I know how to do things. What I want you to do is understand how you think about these kind of things. See the kinds of things that I'm doing as I think about them. Be aware of the kinds of things that you have to worry about so that you don't just sit down and write something down and keep going with it. It's a little like on the exam. Some of you were struggling with figuring out what's the driving force in this first thing. Well, there was no driving force specifically you put in, but when you dealt with the string force, string, spring, when you dealt with the spring force, if you did it right, you said the spring force was a constant times the length of the spring minus the equilibrium length, but the length of the spring was the difference between the top and the bottom positions of the spring. The top of the spring was the position of the car. The bottom of the string was the thing that varied with the road. Well, all right, so when you put that whole thing together, you would have had, an, and you separated stuff out, you would have had an extra term in your force equation that was from the bottom position of the spring that would have come in like a driving force. Most of you are sitting there, okay, I need a driving force. How do I write down a driving force? And, you, and some of you just try, well, I'll just put in the position of the road, and I don't know how I'm going to get a driving force. Well, step back. Think about what do we have here? What is the spring force? The spring force is in magnitude, the spring constant times the length of the spring minus the equilibrium length, right? Not the position of the car, not the position of one end of the spring, the length of the spring. Ah, how mathematically do I say the length of the spring? Think about it that way. Same here thing with here with vectors. I want to make you aware of the kinds of things that you have to pay attention to when you're doing transformations between reference frames with vectors. And then if you're just careful, about what you do and what you refer to things as, you can work it out right, but it's 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 a little tricky. Well, so all right, so I want to start with just straight up transformations between inertial frames because that's easier to think about and easier to deal with. So here's the setup we have here. I'm going to have a inertial frame, which I'll just label X and Z. I'm going to make Z up. So in this case, if you use your right-hand rule, you can figure out Y has to be into the page. And I'm going to have another inertial frame. So in this case, both of them are inertial, which I'm going to label X prime and Z prime. And I'm going to assert that the second frame is moving with velocity V relative to the first frame. And for simplicity here, I've made V in the plus X direction, right? So this V can be anything. But right here for this picture, for simplicity, I've made capital V vector, capital V in the X hat direction. What that is, is the motion of the primed frame relative to the unprimed frame. Now, here's what I want to consider. Suppose there's an object, a ball or something like that, and it's moving with velocity V relative to the unprimed frame. Um, and let's just suppose, let's just suppose now, just for simplicity, suppose that V is equal to V, right? Well, okay. So I made some computer animations here so that you can look at and see what it looks like uh, when you do this. So I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start with just playing the thing, what it looks like in the inertial frame. You've got the unprimed frame um, and the primed frame, and here's the little particle, and I've labeled two vectors R and R prime, all right? So R and R prime um, are, uh, each of them is the displacement of the particle from the origin. So R is from the origin of the unprimed frame and R prime is from the origin of the primed frame. And I'm going to have, in a moment here, I'll start them rolling. These are both inertial frames. So um, what that means is that the primed frame is moving at a constant velocity with respect to the unprimed frame. And I am going to make this particle at rest in the unprimed frame. So what does that look like? Well, there you go. You can see it's moving with the unprimed frame, right? And as you watch, you will notice here as we go along that the R prime vector is not changing. And if you think about it, that should not be surprising. The R prime vector is not changing because what is it? It's the displacement of the particle from the primed origin and the particle is at rest in the primed frame. The R vector, however, is changing. Now, here is the thing. 
the R vector and the unprimed R vector. So the prime R prime vector and the R unprimed R vector, both of those vectors are the same vector regardless of whether you're in the primed or the unprimed frame. Now, this is where you have to be careful. The displacement from the unprimed origin to the particle is unambiguous. It's the same. No matter which frame you're in, no matter which frame uh, you write it in, that vector is the same. And in fact, the components of that vector will be the same on these two frames. I've, well, yeah, because I've lined them up so that there's no relative rotation. So the x direction, y direction, z direction is the same in prime and on prime. What's different is the origin changes position over time. But the r vector at one instant in time, the r vector, the displacement from the unprimed origin to the particle is what it is. Likewise, the r prime vector from the origin of the primed frame to the particle is what it is, right? Now, if instead I said the displacement from the origin to the particle, when you say that, you're being a little not careful enough because the origin of which frame? I have more than one frame here. Well, let's just say the origin of my frame to the particle. That is different in different frames because if you're in the unprimed frame, the origin from my frame to the particle is the r vector and it changes over time. In the primed frame, the origin of my frame to the particle doesn't change over time. So when you say something like dr dt and you evaluate infinite frame, whoa, which thing are we talking about here? Hmm? That's a little scary. Well, okay. So here's the real key is I just want to say that the r vector and the r prime vector in this case, at one instant, the r prime vector is the same in both frames. The r vector is the same in both frames. But when you say the displacement from the origin, you have to make sure you know which origin, which frame are you working in so that you know which of these two vectors that you're talking about. Just for fun, this is what it would look like in the prime frame. Now you can really see that the particle is at rest. And because the unprimed axes are moving, well, that means that the R vector has to stretch out as time goes by just because of the motion of the unprimed axes. And um, I will show both of them together just so you can look at the two of these for comparison at the same time. Basically what I did here is I locked a camera to one frame versus the other frame so that you can see what would it look like if you're in that frame. Is the particle at rest or not? It depends who you ask. All right, so if you go back and you want to look at the equations for this, so in this case, how do you actually do the math of the transformation? Um, well, it's not very hard. What I can say is that V vector prime, and what I mean by that is the velocity as measured in the prime frame is equal to the velocity as measured in the unprimed frame minus the relative velocity of the two frames. That's not all that fancy. If you think about it in one dimension, it's just relative velocity, right? I'm subtracting off the velocities of each other. So in this, right, so this equation here, right, that equation is a general equation um, that always works. Consider our specific case here where V is equal to capital V, V prime in this case is zero. And that was the example I just showed with the movie. Um, so it works in this specific case, but that works in general. That's just relative velocity. And that's all there is to it, really. Now, if you want to figure out what is r prime in terms of r, r prime, it will turn out is equal to r minus capital V times t. Now, that does have the built-in assumption that at t equals zero, the origins of the two frames are aligned with each other. Right, so this, these two equations here that I've circled, those are the Galilean transformation equations that allow you to get... Um, displacements relative to the origin from one frame to the other, and then velocities from one frame to the other. Um, now, unlike the R vector, the V vector is kind of more frame dependent. Now, if I say the velocity of the particle relative to the unprimed frame, that's V vector. That, again, that's an unambiguous thing. But if I say the velocity of the particle, what do I mean? Well, then I have to say which frame I, am I evaluating it in? So when I say the velocity of the particle, um, if I'm in the prime frame, I mean what I call V prime here. That would be what Taylor calls dr dt evaluated in the curly S frame, right? Whereas V would be dr dt evaluated in the curly S zero frame, sort of, although he was talking about rotating frame here. But in that case, so when you say dr dt evaluated in one frame versus another frame, um, and now here's the thing, um, that R again, well, all right, so it's a little different in rotating frames. So we'll come back to that. 
Okay, so now let me try to draw these axes for the rotating frame. So here we have the X, Y, and Z axes. The X is supposed to look like it's coming out of the page. And I'm going to make omega. So that's the rotation of the rotating frame relative to the non-rotating frame. It's going to be like that. And so I'm going to draw Z prime like this. I'm going to draw X prime like this. And y prime like that. All right. So... Um, this is just the same thing that I showed you before when you have the Z prime, X prime, Y prime axes rotating relative to the X, Y, Z axes. Now, what I'm going to do now is draw some particle here. Here's some particle. And I'm going to draw R vector. And in this case, I do not need an R and an R prime because the origin stays the same for both frames at all times. The origins of the two frames are lined up. The directions of the axes are changing, which means the prime frame is a non-inertial frame, but the origin of the frame stays the same all the time. So the R vector is the same vector in both frames, but it has different components in the two frames, right? That's the key. It's the same vector. It goes, points from the same position to the same position. It's the same vector, but it has different components, right? So, so that's, that's a thing. What's the difference? It's like, for example, let's just, let's go to 2D for a moment. If I just have two axes and they're not rotating or anything, here's X prime, here's Y prime, here's X, here's Y, and I have some position and I do the vec the position of that guy from the origin, R vector. That vector is what it is. It points in the direction that it is. It has the length that it has. It's going to be pointing up and to the right, but the X and Y components are going to be different, right? Here's the Y prime component. There's the X prime component, whereas that would be the X component and that would be the Y component, right? So if your axes are rotated relative to each other, the vector will have different components, but it's the same vector. So I don't have to worry about an R versus an R prime here, but I do have to worry about which frame I'm evaluating the components in. Well, okay, so that's just the R vector. But what happens when we come to the V vector? All right, well, so here's a little... Uh, animation of one of these things. So once again, the solid, the 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 unprimed things are the three vectors that are at rest, the, the more saturated colors, right? You've got X, Y, and Z there. The white thing sticking out of the north pole of the earth is the omega vector. And then the more faded pastel colored vectors are the primed vectors. Now this, I should say that this set of primed vectors is a perverse set of vector, or sorry, the primed axes is a perverse set of axes to use on the Earth, because you will notice that the z-axis does not point north, up through the North Pole, right? The omega vector goes to the North Pole. So if you were on Earth, it would be much more natural to align your z-axis along the axis of rotation of the Earth. So what do these axes represent? Well, the real reason I'm doing this is so these match the axes like Taylor used that occasionally the primed, you know, see every so often there's an instant where the primed and unprimed axes line up with each other. But there is actually a physical interpretation you could use. The um, unprimed axes here could actually be the reference frame of the sun, which if you remember your Copernicus, the sun is at rest. Now you're saying, oh, no, no, but there's a little reflex motion because of Jupiter. Man, 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 forget that. But wait, it's going around the center of the galaxy. Man, 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 forget that. Um, the sun's at rest. So the unprimed axes, the rest axes here, are the axes of the sun, and then the z-axis is solar north. That is also perpendicular to the plane of Earth's orbit. Actually, I don't know if the sun is perfectly aligned with the plane of Earth's orbit. Pretty close. But let's say that is the plane of the Earth's orbit. It turns out the Earth's rotation axis is tilted relative to its orbit axis. And so that's what this omega would represent. So then this x, y, z would be something that's measured by somebody who's in the sun's frame of reference, but then wants to rotate it along with the earth, right? So that's what you use instead of putting z up with earth. The real reason I did this, though, is so that you can sort of see what's going on here. Okay, well, all right, so we want to see, we want to see this. So, so let's, let's fade the earth away so that we can see these vectors a little bit more. And the Earth fades all the way away. All right, so now we've got some of these vectors that you can see here. So again, the um, white vector pointing up and to the right, that's the omega vector. That's the rotation of the prime frame relative to the unprime frame. I have labeled the R and V vectors here. What do they mean? Okay, so the R vector is the displacement from the origin to this 
purple particle that I've got here. And then, again, it's the same vector in both frames. But if you think about the components, in the rotating frame, the components are fixed, right? Notice that the R vector rotates with the rotating axes. So the components of R vector are exactly the same at all times in the rotating frame. But in the inertial frame, in the frame that's at rest here, obviously the R vector is moving around, so its components are changing with time. So at one instant, the vector, the vector is the same, but the components will be different. Okay. All right. Now, so, so what I mean when I say the vector is the same? Well, so for example, if I take omega cross R, we'll pause this here, and if I look at this and I take omega, which is like that, cross R, which is sort of um, into the into the page at an angle here, I get a V vector that kind of points like that, right? Omega cross R is V. I did that just looking at the vectors. It doesn't matter if I use the components of the vector, both the omega and the R vectors in the primed or unprimed frame, I will get a V pointing in that direction properly. Omega cross R as a vector gives you the same thing regardless of whose components you use, right? Now, of course, the omega vector is not constant in the rotating frame here. It's constant in the inertial frame. It's not constant in the rotating frame, right? Because, I mean, just look at it. You'll see that now here it's pointing in plus x and y, and now it's in plus x minus y, and now it's minus x, y, and now it's minus y plus x plus x, y again. So the omega vector has different components at different times. But if I do omega cross r at any time, I'm going to get this orange v vector. What is the meaning of the orange v vector? That is the velocity of the particle in the inertial frame. The velocity of the particle in the rotating frame is zero, right? You see there, there's the surface of the Earth. It's always there in uh, Northern Africa somewhere, right? The, the particle is staying at the same point in the rotating frame. So the velocity of this particle in the rotating frame is zero, whereas the velocity of the particle in the non-rotating frame is clearly not zero. Omega cross R gives you the velocity of the particle in the non-rotating frame, right? So that's that's pretty important. Now, omega cross r, again, I could evaluate that in the rotating frame and get a v, but how would I interpret that v? I would say that's the v relative to the non-rotating axes. That's not the v in my frame if I am in the inertial frame, right? So you've got to be a little careful about this, and you've got to think about this, and you've got to think, okay, which, which frame am I evaluating the components in, and which frame am I evaluating the vector in. And so when I say what is dr dt, well, in the unprimed frame, sorry, in the prime frame, and the rotating frame, dr dt is zero because it's always right there in northern Africa and it's always at the same spot. In the primed frame, that's the prime frame, in the unprimed frame, in the inertial frame, dr dt is clearly not zero because it's going a circle around here around the omega axis. So DRDT evaluated in the inertial frame is different from DRDT evaluated in the non-inertial frame. And that's where this equation comes in, this DQDT, evaluating the derivative of a vector in two different frames. Right, so I'm just going to write this out again here for deep epistemological reasons. Right, so DQDT, where Q is any vector evaluated in the inertial frame as zero, is equal to dq vector by dt evaluated in the rotating frame plus omega cross that vector, okay? So this right here, this means evaluated in inertial frame. This here means evaluated in the rotating frame. And this is the omega of the rotating frame, right? Well, so um, let's consider in this case, if we consider the R vector, Q is equal to R, what do we know? Well, one thing we know is that dr by dt evaluated in the rotating frame is zero, right? That is for the example that I was just showing in the movie. Um, where the thing is at rest in the rotating frame, right? Stuck there in Northern Africa somewhere. So if we use this equation, we get that dr dt evaluated in the inertial frame is equal to dr dt in the rotating frame, which is zero, plus omega cross r, 
and hey, look, we have V. What do I mean by V? I mean the velocity as measured in the inertial frame, right? That's what dr dt sub curly S0 is, is equal to omega cross R. And that's exactly the V equals omega cross R that we had before. So it all kinds of hangs together. Okay, so that's it for what I've said so far. Um, uh, the main thing I want you to take away from this is you have to be a little bit careful when talking about vectors and components of vectors in different frames. Um, you can go back and look at the details of what's going on here. But what I'm going to do next is try and take this and talk specifically about um, how this math and how these frame transformations and how this dq dt equation leads to the Coriolis and centrifugal forces. But that's for another video.